Hello everybody. I'm Ruth Darlene, founder and executive director of Women SV, Women of Silicon Valley, a program that focuses on covert abuse and coercive control. I created this uh, program, the Executive Summary Workshop, to help women who've been through abusive relationships, particularly involving covert abuse and coercive control, to organize their thoughts in a linear, coherent way uh, that can express the whole uh, experience of what has happened to them in a form that other people can hear and understand. Because trauma has a dissociative effect on your mind and we often refer to trauma brain with survivors who've been through a process that impacts their ability to think clearly and recall all the details and in chronological order of the horror and, uh, uh, and abuse that they've experienced. So uh, sometimes sitting with somebody, whether it be an advocate or an attorney, uh, a faith leader or a friend uh, can help guide them through this process so they're not going down into that dark, deep cellar uh, to uh, retrieve memories that have been horrifying and uh, cruel and uh, damaging to their heart and their soul. So um, bless all of those of you who are here today to help survivors do that. And for survivors who are here today, I hope this, this workshop helps you gather your thoughts in a way that you can organize them to express to an advocate, to an attorney, to a police officer, to a certified divorce financial uh, analyst, uh, or to a faith leader, to a friend, or even to make sense of what happened uh, for yourself. It's hard to do that if uh, you don't have forensic evidence like broken bones or bruises uh, to show for. It can be much uh, more difficult to wrap your mind around the experience and then express it to somebody else in a way that they can understand and then uh, give you support accordingly. So uh, I'm very, very grateful to my dear friend and colleague, Rachel McKenzie, for being uh, willing to present the, the this workshop to you today uh, on my behalf. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there in person, uh, but I turn it over now to the very capable uh, and expert hands of Rachel McKenzie. Thank you, Rachel, and please enjoy the workshop. Thank you, Ruth. And it is my honor to be here, to be asked by her to be able to present her new baby, basically. So my name is Rachel McKenzie. For those of you folks who don't know me, I'm the managing attorney at the Pro Bono Project. I'm also the chair of the Family Law Bar this year. And I sit on numerous uh, systems committees throughout the um, domestic violence community, um, legal committees, systems committees, conference committees, Okay, so welcome to the last workshop of the day. And I know we all might be a little sleepy after lunch, but I have a very loud voice and hopefully that will keep you awake. Yes. So let's get started. Um, we're here to discuss, obviously, Ruth Darlene's Executive Summary Workshop. And Ruth has given me a script, as I said earlier, but told me I don't need to follow it. And I don't like to read out loud in front of groups, so I'm gonna do a little bit of both. Um, Okay, so the executive summary is a document that a survivor can create for a specific purpose. Often that purpose, however, is multidimensional. It can be to share one's story, it can be to be able to remember one's story, it can be to be able to digest and heal from that story, and these are just a few things. To be able to share that story, perhaps, this document, the executive summary, is a fluid document. So it might get tweaked for each person she wants to share the story with. Was it with a lawyer or an advocate instead of perhaps a financial professional? A little bit different side of the story to share with them. So we're gonna talk about all these things. Okay, oh, too late. So, um, the victim or survivor, if the victim or survivor is still living with her partner and or if there are children around, um, this is even more important. And the executive summary document really needs to be kept in a safe place. It needs to be kept where prying eyes aren't gonna see it, where little hands aren't gonna find it. And it is something that really shouldn't be shared with those who are not intended to see it or even on accident. Um, 
So that means maybe for the survivor who is going to be creating the executive summary, maybe a pen and paper is better than, for example, a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and that could be simply because that computer could be downloading or updating to the cloud. You might not know. Maybe um, that computer has been on the home router. Its history can be traced, um, et cetera. So not only where to keep it, but when and where do you want to write on it as well. These are all things as advocates or as attorneys when we're helping survivors prepare their stories. These are all concerns that we should be having in our conversation. Ruth shares the story of a woman SV survivor. That's a woman SV, by the way, women of Silicon Valley. They're located um, up in the North County. And um, so the survivor crafted her summary while still living with her partner. And he was a physicist. And he had not read a poem since high school. So she kept her sensitive notes and evidence in a binder labeled poetry because that was probably the last place he would ever look. And for in fact, he did not look there. Now, hiding in plain sight for some people can be just fine, but for others, it, it, it wouldn't work. So it's always important to run that you know, risk-benefit analysis um, when we're talking about these kinds of sensitive documents, images, evidence, et cetera. Um, if there is any suspicion of a future possibility that your devices or the survivor's devices might be compromised, whether it's your cell phone or the um, cloud, even a Dropbox, computer, etc., I again, and Ruth again would suggest a handwritten document stored in a secure location, maybe in a friend's house or at work in your desk, perhaps. Um, Otherwise, if the partner does find it, it could lead to very serious possible harm, um, both physical and mental, emotional, et cetera. Um, and it allows, it would give them, as Ruth says, the ammunition for their counterattack. And in many course of control situations, you have a very sophisticated abuser who's going to use that information. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in depth. So, um, we need to remember that even a safety plan can put someone in danger if it falls into the wrong hands. So we want to consider cloud storage, physical storage, perhaps a brand new outside computer kept at a friend's house to create these sensitive documents, paperwork, things like that that the opposing party does not need to see. <coughs> So it's at this point that we want to make a statement um, about genderizing and, um, and an affirmation for that matter as well. And I am absolutely aware and acknowledge that men can be victims and women can be abusers and perpetrators of abuse. That is absolutely true. And female, male, trans, non-binary, any kind of gender identity being human opens you up to being a victim. Being human also gives you the ability to be an abuser. So it can be anyone. However, the Department of Justice says that over 90% of domestic violence victims are women. And so women as these focus is on women. And so today, just for sake of ease, I'm going to be using the pronouns she for victim and he for abuser. And I'm sorry if that offends anyone. We also intertwine sometimes victim and survivor. Um, we use them a lot. Um, similarly, they both have different connotations. Choose your own vocabulary on that one. I, I personally choose to say survivor, um, but the term victim is also applicable in the sense of a victim of crime, 
You know, that is a, a, a slight different spin on the term of victim. So let's keep that in mind as well. So, men, is, men. <laughs> Ruth has given me a caveat to let you know, and that is that the Executive Summary Workshop Guide is not intended as legal advice, but rather uh, for the sole purpose of helping survivors organize their thoughts around a very complicated and traumatic history in order to convey, highlight, and differentiate parts to different audiences in a coherent, linear way, which is difficult to do when at home, which home should be a sanctuary, and your home has been turned into a battlefield. So along those lines, please realize that this is not legal advice. This document that is being created and how to create it is not being given to you as legal advice, but more as a tool. Attorneys, law enforcement, financial advisors, cybersecurity experts, clergy, and other providers can use the executive summary workshop in giving clients advice about their individual expertise, financial expertise, religious expertise, et cetera. Advocates can only use this executive summary to be able to help survivors organize and make sense of their experiences. This should not be a vehicle for advocates to give legal advice. So please consult with an attorney before taking any significant action or decision, as Ruth says, and always consider domestic violence advocates as your allies, but check with them before sharing their name or contact information of their organization. Okay, so first of all, we have the client who's going to be coming in to talk with us, and we need to be prepared, right? We need to have safety for everyone, and that includes emotional safety as well as physical safety. So we need to start in a safe space. We need to understand that this process, this conversation, is going to take a while. It's going to be traumatic for our client. It's also going to be probably vicariously traumatic for us. So we need to prepare for that. We need to have a quiet, uninterrupted space maybe a white noise machine if you're in a busy office, maybe some water, a box of tissues, notepad, pen and paper, to help everyone get prepared. But equally, in, equally important is your mental and emotional state. So Bruce suggests maybe setting a time limit, or if you or the other person or both have had enough, maybe stop. Stop the appointment at the moment. Stop the conversation and start it again at a, on another time. Um, you also need to remember some self-care for yourself and suggest to your client as well. A walk in the woods, some for forest bathing, as they call it now, or maybe a good half an hour with a book. Set aside 10 minutes for you to sit and look at the birds. Whatever it is for you, something for you to be able to clear your mind and digest the issues and the trauma. Something for the client to also do for themselves that will help benefit them. Okay, so we are going to be talking possibly about some things that might have a trigger, so I need to give a trigger warning, of course. There is a safe space room to go out the back door, down the outside hall. There's signs out there, and there's a very nice safe space. It's a quiet room, got some little activities in there, so if you do feel you're getting a little anxious or if things are getting a little tough, please take advantage of that, or even out in the hallway or outside. So, and by all means, just go ahead and slip out. So, again about self-care, um, Ruth, Ruth suggests um, starting with it, a reminder of it, and ending with a reminder of it with your client. So it will stay in both the forefronts of your mind kind of as we're trained to keep bias in the forefront. 
or to keep trauma-informed lens in the forefront of our minds. Same thing about self-care. Make sure you remember to help yourself and to help your client help herself. Okay, so let's move on to the actual tangibility of the executive summary. It's designed to capture the more obvious forms of abuse, like physical and sexual assault, but it can also capture the more subtle forms included in, in course of control. Dr. Evan Stark, who literally wrote the book on course of control, um, he calls domestic violence a gender-based crime that is generally perpetrated by men against women. I beg your pardon, not domestic violence. He calls coercive control a gender-based crime. And for those of you who aren't familiar, coercive control is a, a pattern of controlling, threatening, and isolating behaviors. It also often involves the turning of an intimate partner into a type of prisoner with excessive and unreasonable rules, regulations, and consequences, um, usually centered around traditionally female tasks, but not always, such as shopping, housekeeping, meal preparation, and childcare. Um, Coercive control can range anywhere from psychological manipulation all the way to the more physical acts such as strangulation. Many of us are familiar with the power and control wheel, which looks like this. If you aren't familiar with it, by all means email me and I will send you one. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> but many, many, many of the coercive control attributes, for lack of a better word, are listed on the power and control wheel. It really helps to spark discussion, um, the kind of discussion that is encapsulated within the executive summary. More forward, this is why I don't like reading out loud. More subtle forms, of course, of control tend to involve a pattern. Um, it's not really just a single blow, but instead it's death by a thousand cuts. It's that chip, chip, chipping away of, you know, individual liberties, of uh, freedom, of peace of mind, of safety, and of independence. And over and over the abuser may tell her how stupid and useless she is, um, even if she's a professor or an attorney or a successful businesswoman. Every move is monitored, controlled, and judged by the abuser. She's constantly threatened and separated from extended family and friends. If she tries to leave, he often threatens to take the children, take everything, hunt her down, destroy her, basically, for lack of other words. Um, Ruth equates it to that victim being like living in a war zone. And like being a prisoner of war, uh, Dr. Psych a, a well-known psychiatrist in this work, Dr. Judith Harriman, um, also equates it to being like a prisoner of war because the same kind of techniques to wear people down are used in both circumstances, such as brainwashing, coercion, threats, psychological torture, eroding any sense of independent identity, and so many more things. But these tactics are ongoing and cumulative both for the prisoner of war as well as for the coercive control victim. The abuser will wear his victim down over time. I wrote like water falling on a stone, but really more like Coca-Cola eroding out a tooth, right? It doesn't, it can happen slowly, more quickly or fast. There is no set timeline for course of control. It is something that is a pattern of behavior that worsens and worsens over time, usually. And it is codified now as abuse in California. So all of this trauma is gonna be able to impact our, our client, our survivor, to be able to tell her story in a coherent and logical fashion. 
So a court of law is not going to be able to understand the circular thinking and descriptions of many, many victims. And that can possibly work adversely then on the victim's credibility and on the way for her to positively impact her case in a court of law. So the more linear a story can be told, the more credibility we find the courts give to people. And what do we mean by credibility? People are gonna believe you. That's what we mean. And how do abusers take advantage of that? Here's a horrific example, in my opinion. Um, so one of Ruth's clients at Women SV, um, would, she would worry about her husband and what he would do if he found out that she wanted to leave, wanted to file for divorce, wanted to file a restraining order. And she ended up on a 5150. What that means is, is the police took her in because she was mentally unstable, a danger to herself and to others. Okay, here's the story. She told her husband she wanted a divorce, that she was tired of his lies and the gaslighting and the affairs that he'd been having. So he proceeded to harass and chase her around the house all night, keeping her up, smashing plates all over the house. He was shattering mirrors and he ended up threatening her with a knife. She called the police. He got to the police first in the driveway and he said, thank God you're here. I'm a therapist and I do believe my wife is having another one of her psychotic meltdowns. She has trashed our house and threatened our children. Please help me to help her. I do believe she should be on a 5150 hold for her own safety and for the children's. So the police came into the house. They find her looking frazzled and beside herself. They see the shattered plates, the broken mirrors, the knife on the counter. She tries to explain and is very less coherent than he is coming across with statements. So the police take her to the psychiatric unit and lock her up. He comes to visit her and she says, why did you do that? And he says, because I can. Right? This is a person who you do not want to have your evidence against them. This is a person who believes he is always one step ahead of the game. And in this situation, he was. But I've been doing this work for almost 20 years, and I firmly believe, firmly believe, I have to believe, that in truth is justice. So that if you can get the truth to the court, justice will prevail. So although the system failed her in this example on the 5150 hold, the explanation of that, if told coherently, is a very valid reason to ask for a restraining order. Along the same lines, another tactic has been heard so often at Women SV that they have a similar name for it, and it's called um, the engineered restraining order. And I'm gonna go off script for this one. But I think those of us who work in this field really know what we mean by the engineered restraining order. When, again, to genderize, husband files, wife files domestic violence restraining order serves husband, husband files against wife, a domestic violence restraining order. And that can be done for several reasons. That can be done, maybe he can, thinks there was domestic violence, valid. Maybe his attorney told him, oh, it'll, be make it, it'll make it easier for her to lose hers if you file one against her. Maybe he just assumed, well, wait a minute, how can she get the leg up? I'm gonna file one against her. So these are the engineered restraining orders, the ones that don't necessarily have the basis to be granted 
but the truth is either stretched, omitted, or manipulated to in fact be a lie to have the restraining order granted. How many of you have seen that before? Yeah, it happens a lot. It happens too much. Um, I try and train against that. <laughs> um, so, uh, oh, I skipped one. Um, this is Dr. Judith Herman, and she um, states, in order to escape accountability for his crimes, the perpetrator does everything in his power to promote forgetting. If secrecy fails, the perpetrator attacks the credibility of a, his victim. If he cannot silence her absolutely, he tries to make sure no one listens. <coughs> so in other words, as one survivor puts it, he lies much better than I tell the truth, right? And we've seen this. This is them, them, the abuser, wanting to do everything in his power to discredit the victim and will often use her actions against her, such as the 5150 hold. Um, the, this is a very typical pattern. It is seen often, whether it is involving an engineered restraining order or not. This is usually the argument was that, no, I was defending myself, no, she's crazy, no, she lies, no, she makes stuff up. And, um, and sometimes that silencing can be done with just a glance or just a look uh, because the victim knows what will be coming next if she continues. So the executive summary workshop purpose is to basically speed up the process of creating a coherent document to be able to provide to someone such as the court. So you turn a, tra a traumatizing nightmare into a coherent narrative and us, the assistant, the advocate, the attorney, as Ruth would say, we act as the left brain, right? So we help give the support, comfort, and validation to be able to get all of these stories down and all of the important information put together. So these are the seven steps to be able to create a concise summary of what happened, right? So let's look at them. So a goal. We want to talk about what goal is this executive summary going to do? Does your client want to give this to the court? Does your client want to use this to heal? Does your client need to try and put stuff in chronological order? What, what is she using this for? So that would be the end goal. But remember that this is a fluid document. It can be written and rewritten. It can be copied and pasted and edited. But this here is the starting point. So once she figures out what the goal is, why she wants to put this together, then she can decide what the audience is. They kind of go hand in hand, right? My goal is to give this to the court. So consequently, is your audience the judge or maybe an attorney? My goal is to um, figure out what my financial situation is. So maybe I want to share my story with a financial analyst. Um, maybe I am not able to talk about it, but I want my mom and family to read what I've been through. A different document, perhaps, than giving to the court. All, however, the executive summary. So, as many of us know, it's important for a legal argument to have a timeline, right? Oftentimes, if we're in court, the judge will ask the victim, what was the worst incident? What was the recent, most recent incident? How long has this been going on for? And those questions alone can throw a traumatized brain into a spiral. 
So the executive summary helps prepare all of that. Um, some survivors already might have a timeline put together. And if they do, great. That will definitely help them in their executive summary construction. Um, and if they don't, that's fine. We can put one together while we sit here and talk. So this is what Ruth calls the incident and allegation log. And basically what it's designed to do is be a data dump, right? So this is a worksheet and it's the big bucket that's gonna hold all of the different forms of abuse, the incidents that the victim wants to record, that she can remember, that she can draw from, depending on what the goals are for the audience. And along with that, on the same document, she can re also record any false statements that he's made, any allegations of abuse that she, he says she's committed, or anything that she thinks, anything that's valid to her should be put down here. These check boxes on the side, this is just an example. Here's some other things, other types of abuse. And finally, even more. I think that this, what we call, or what Ruth calls the data dump, is really helpful because it does not have to go in chronological order this way. You can start out by saying, did he ever kick you? Yeah, he kicked me. You know, do you remember when that was? Well, the kid was three, so maybe that was in 2021. All right, great, 2021, good enough right now, right? He kicked me. Why did he kick you? Well, he had earlier, and then the memories start coming back, right? Well, he kicked me because earlier I had told him I wasn't able to cook dinner because he hadn't given me any money for groceries. Bing, no money for groceries. Something else to write down, right? Your working is the left brain. Why did he not give you any money for groceries? He was mad at me because I was three minutes late getting home from picking up the child from school. Bing, there's another incident of coercive control. So you see where we go with this. All of these things can be used in this form. They can be used on binder paper, although the worksheet is quite handy. Um, so you would want to go through then and you can see what else is involved. Were children involved? Were they present? Did they witness? Were they there? Important questions. Um, what happened? Why did this happen? What does he say happened, etc. So in other words, this is organizing all of the thoughts about this one incident. And then you start again for another incident and again for another. Ruth states, without support, without guidance, it's easy for a survivor to become discouraged, overwhelmed, and want to give up. Maybe even go back to her abuser because it's easier. Here's a graphic that Women SVs created to illustrate some of the many ways a survivor comes under attack at the hands of her partner. If you start asking her about different areas of her life, you will generally find how pervasive the abuse is. She can use this graphic to help her recall examples from her own experience that she can include in her incident and allegations log. If she is working, he may call up her boss and complain about her and express concern for her mental health. He may do the same kind of things to her friends, mutual friends, and even their friends that are couples. He may pressure her to stop working to raise the kids, then cut off her access to the joint finances and putting her on an allowance, and making her beg for money to run the household. I've seen it. I think we probably all have. He may hide significant amounts of his income and put her on an allowance, give, take away her debit card, and run up huge debt without her knowledge. Or, in one of my client's cases, have a huge gambling problem. Ruth continues, 
that the abuser may not allow the survivor to see the income tax return. He might even sign it for her. I have seen that happen on several occasions. He may force her to sign a restrictive prenuptial agreement or postnuptial agreement that's being signed under duress. There are legal actions for that. He may threaten to ruin her career, to make her homeless, to take the children away if she ever leaves. He may undermine her relationship with her children and work to turn them against her. All very common. Parental alienation, especially post-separation. And all of this kind of trauma can be crippling, right? Even the most basic task can seem insurmountable under trauma. Um, I recall myself once dealing with trauma, going to the grocery store to buy some meat for dinner and standing at the meat fridge or whatever, I just started crying because I couldn't make the decision. I had too much else in my mind. So these kinds of things, trauma, trauma does strange things to the brain. And so consequently, any tool that you can give to a survivor to help them put linear, cohesive thought together is a bonus. If you heard me speak from the last workshop um, or saw the written materials there, which actually um, will be posted on the Office of Gender-Based Violence's website after the conference, um, I included in my submission two other tools. One is an, an article that I wrote myself about how to elicit the information we're seeking to put into the ex executive summary. But then even more so is the Better Women's Justice Project um, has a program called SAFER, which unfortunately I don't recall what it stands for. But they also um, provide what I, I call, um, you know, my interview outline or something to that effect. They call them screening resources. So if you're, email me and I'm happy to send you either or both of those. Um, so, getting back to the point, if either of your, if your client is unable to even begin, there are tools out there to help start this conversation as well. And, and that's important. There's also prompts and things to listen for. So, um, Another thing that I said, and I want to just touch base on right now, is something, advocates are very good at this, attorneys are not, is to treat people with humanity and empathy, and compassion, right? This person is having a very bad day. That is why they have come to talk with you. Just give them the respect that you would want to have in that situation as well. Be a human, talk to the person, not the issue. That's my two cents on that. So, these are some more documents that can also help survivors begin to identify abuse that they may have experienced, and um, we're, we're also going to talk about these as well. So along with the incident allegation log, um, there is the power and control wheel, which um, is a fabulous tool. Um, then there are um, the course of control checklist, of course, Betterman's chart of coercion, the web scale, the danger assessment, the family code 6320, which lists actually the domestic violence information and illegality of it, um, as well as the executive summary, of course. So we can refer to 6320 if the survivor is looking for a restraining order. It's a relatively new law. And it um, pretty much states course of control it does call it course of control in that it is a grounds for a restraining order in the family court. Um, and therefore, if that restraining order becomes violated, the violator is guilty of a misdemeanor. So, as I tell my clients, um, you know, he's been texting me, 
make him stop texting me. I'm like, you have a restraining order. You have the power. Tell the police that he's been texting you. Show them the texts. They will arrest him. He will go to jail. He will learn very quickly to stop texting you. And for most of them, that's true. For some of them, not necessarily. But 6320 does codify um, course of control. It talks about the disturbing of the peace. It talks about um, the method and the pattern used in course of control where it doesn't have to be physical violence. It can be financial. It can be emotional. It can be isolation, manipulation, harassment, uh, etc. So if you want the that full dicta on that uh, course of control. Again, Family Code Section 6320, you can Google it. You can also email me if you want it. I am not going to read it right now. So here's a better picture of the power and control wheel. And I am running a little behind, but that's okay. Um, so again, I'm sure we've all seen this, and if we haven't, we now have. And um, Again, I want to reiterate, this is one of my favorite tools to spark conversation with clients. I'll even hand it to her and I'll say, let's talk about this together. Ruth states that the power and control wheel is a tool to educate survivors and help them consider a number of different ways abuse may have been perpetrated in their daily relationship. However, it doesn't capture the full story of course of control. That's true. It's missing a few things like stalking, technological abuse, micromanagement, monopolization of perception, and some others. Um, but just wanted to give you a few examples of those, and we are certainly can talk about uh, what the power and control wheel says, but I think we're all pretty familiar with it. Okay, and that really is a a workshop all in itself. Um, meanwhile, oh, wrong one. Sorry. Okay. So this is um, Bitterman's chart, right, for coercion, and it's another tool to be able to use. And you can compare it to Amnesty International's report on torture tactics. Again, same torture, same report, same in, same chart of coercion. And um, there are a lot of similarities, uh, including the symptoms of anxiety, depression, and PTSD. Um, so reviewing this chart can be helpful for survivors to recall as well. Another good tool to spark that conversation. So monopolization of perception is something I did want to touch base on. This type of abuse, this, sorry, this type of abuser acts if the world revolves around him. Any attention devoted to anything that doesn't involve him is seen as selfish or irrelevant. All right, now it's starting to ring some bells, right? And so in the end, he proves to be right about this too, and he is right and must be right about everything else. The world, your world, and everything revolving around him, it is all up to him. And the very interesting thing about this is that it can lead to Stockholm Syndrome, um, as well as for your children as well. Um, it is every ounce, when every ounce of your attention is going to placating him and preserving his peace and pleasing him, surrendering power to him so that any of the needs of anybody else are swept away. That is the monopolization of perception. Um, it really is narcissism plus. Um, I think it's horrible, especially even more horrible, especially when there's kids involved and the older I get the harder that part gets for me it, it it's um can be so damaging to the little ones 
Um, so um, the monopolizer will also then start throwing false accusations, forcing her to avenge herself constantly um, against blame, against micromanaging, invasion of personal space. But then he will also monopolize her time in the sense that it will be cont continual calls, texts, and monitoring, things like that. Um, then of course, um, Thurin goes on to discuss uh, the induced debility and exhaustion, which is kind of the same example of the 5150, the woman who was kept up all night, uh, sleep deprivation, she is being limited um, or her access to resources are controlled, whether financial, um, sleep, food, money, friends, those kinds of resources and others as well. And then of course threats, I think we're all pretty familiar with threats. If you ever leave me, I will, I'm gonna take the children. Uh, you're going to be a bag lady. Um, I'm going to hunt you down. I will destroy you. You will never see your kids again. I'm going to move away and you won't find them. Or maybe an implied threat. Maybe he just takes his gun out and starts cleaning it, walking up and down the hallway. Also a little weird, right? Not healthy behavior. Very abusive. It's called intimidation and manipulation. It's also an implied threat. So the occasional indulgence is an interesting thing. Um, and we look here that the abuser isn't terrible all the time. Sometimes we call this the honeymoon period. Sometimes this is in the cycle of abuse, right? Where, oh, honey, I'm so sorry, it will never happen again, I won't do that, here's a wonderful present, right? And then I'm gonna knock your teeth out two days from now, or whatever. Um, but those occasional indulgences, those are part of the pattern. And then um, demonstrating omnipotence is also a similar fashion in the sense of, it really goes hand in hand with all the other things. I know it all, you don't know anything. You, victim needs to please abuser because abuser is always right. Victim needs to know that she's constantly watched and being, and needs to be aware of that so she doesn't screw up. Whether there's cameras in the house or the uh, phone is being monitored or there's an air tag in the car, right? Or all of these different things. Degradation, I'm running a little behind so I'm gonna go a little faster through some of these. Degradation, obvious, on the, um, power and control wheel, we call it shaming. And it is um, one of the most horrific things you can do to someone who's supposed to be your loved one. Constant put downs, constant blame, constant shaming, constant name calling, horrid, horrid things, which really ha prevent her from being able to realize she has her own power because she now believes everything that he's telling her. That's the Stockholm Syndrome aspect of it. Enforcing trivial demands, um, go get my beer. Um, I don't know why you put the carrots on the plate that way. Whatever, right? Okay, and then of course there's this, the danger assessment. How many in here have heard and or used the danger assessment? Oh, not very many, okay. So this is a tool um, that is used, has been used in several different fields. Um, sometimes therapists will use it, sometimes law enforcement might use it, sometimes, um, I would say five to 10 years ago, I would use it. Um, there are other tools for me to use now. But the danger assessment is a series of 20 questions. It's created by Dr. Jackie Campbell. And it gets really to the more obvious forms of abuse. Um, you can Google it um, to get all of the questions. 
there are 20, I believe, but it really gets the lethality risks, right? Um, including gun ownership, strangulation, stalking, and homicide threats, or any kind of side threats. Um, so the questions, we can, I'm not gonna read them out, but they, this is another thing that can also spark conversation. However, one thing to know about this is that um, with a score, let me find the score here. And of course I can't remember it. I think it's over 13. Is it domestic violence? Absolute. Um, I personally like to shy away from things that are black and white like that. But um, again, it, this is a great tool to begin to spark conversation. Um, we can even see that in number 13, it actually even begins to get to course of control, which being put together several years ago, it really, it really was at the forefront at the time. It's not lagging now. It just has a, a different use for the actual questions um, than what we are going to be using it for in this discussion. Um, let's move on to the web scale, the women's experience with battering scale. When Ruth talked with Dr. Stark about this, um, Dr. Stark agreed that the, the web scale was better at getting towards the course of control abuse, more so than the danger assessment. Again, danger assessment is more for um, the, I hate to say more obvious forms of abuse because that is a misnomer, but by obvious I mean the things that the lay people would commonly consider abuse. That's what I mean. Whereas co course of control, lots of people just think that's an unhappy marriage. And, and you know, on the lower end, it, it's a bad marriage. On the higher end, or in the, in the middle, it's domestic violence. So, so when we look at the web scale, um, it again is a very helpful instrument to get towards course of control. And sometimes survivors will score or on the danger assessment, but then take the web and score off the chart. And that's just because of the different questions. Um, you can see, for example, um, the victim is going to answer that they either agree or disagree, right? Number one is strongly disagree, six is strongly agree. So he makes me feel unsafe even in my home. Or, I feel like he kicks me prisoner. Or, um, I feel like I'm programmed to react in a certain way to him. And those are things that victims feel they, they have to do to be able to maintain the level of complacence that they have at, within their home. Um, Ruth suggests that when doing the web scale with survivors, we ask them to describe their worst moment and how that they would rate these statements, whether past or present. And sometimes they start off scoring a statement low, saying it wasn't too bad. But then when we revisit some of those statements after some of the examples that they have given for other statements, they end up changing their answers because that memory then comes back clear, becomes re more returned, and is able to be triggered, perhaps, but in a healthier way to be able to start digesting the trauma. Again, the web scale, he can scare me without laying a hand on me. I think that's, that's a big one these days. And he has a look that goes straight through me and terrifies me. I hear this one a lot coming from clients when we're sitting in court at the council table. And 
if for some reason they need eyes and he gives her that look, she will fall. So I sit in between. I tell her not to look. Don't address, even if you're sitting on the stand, you look at me or you look at his lawyer. Don't look at him. Because abusers have tactics that require no words, but just a glance. And a reminder is that um, a score of 20 and up is um, an indicator of domestic violence. And that is adding all of the numbers together. So please Google that. The, the web is actually very interesting. Um, so here is the coercive control checklist. Let's go back to that one. And um, oh, good on time. This is also another tool. So this is something um, that is relatively new, and it is something that um, uses. It, it talks about bricks, right, to build the wall. So, for example, the a brick of seduction. Um, let me explain. Breaks of seductions are actions that look harmless, but are actually being used to gain control. Okay, for example, setting up a computer for her, but really using that access to install spyware, right? Discouraging her from, from pursuing her goals because he will take care of her, and then later using that against her and calling her a mood to parasite or a gold digger. Right? Those are breaks of seduction. Oh no, honey, it's all going to be fine. I'm seducing you to come with me. And then I'm just going to shoot you in the foot afterwards. Bad pun, I'm sorry. But you know what I mean. Um, again, just kind of speeding through the bricks because many of them are self-explanatory. What? Oh, I'm pressing the wrong button. I'm so sorry, guys. There it is. All right. Um, bricks of alienation from the children, very common. We see this a lot. Um, your mom says that she's going to take you away and you'll never see me again. You don't want that, do you? Or, um, you know, your mom is a very bad person. I think you should come and live with me. Don't you want that? You need to tell your mom that. Um, creating self-doubt. Kind of goes along with gaslighting, hand in hand, mind games, and humiliation, also very clear. Um, negation, she's never right. Doesn't matter what she says, she's never right. Even if she says it, she's wrong, and then he says it, she's still wrong, but he's right. Bricks of neglect, the silent treatment, um, or silence, violence, um, the withdrawal of love could be neglect, um, the no empathy, no compassion, no partnership could also be something that's on there, as well as, co as course of betrayal. Uh, bricks of intimidation. Um, she says something that upsets him and he spends the rest of the evening slamming doors and telling her how bad she was to say it and punching walls and etc. And then he gets his gun out and starts cleaning it. Maybe that, that could be extravagant, it could be, it could be true. But that's intimidation. Physical injury, pretty clear. Sexual injury, also pretty clear. Okay. So, you have now talked with your client about all of these different things, used the tools that we've just talked about to spark conversation and memory. You've been keeping your data dump and the ideas that pop up in your incident and um, accusation law. And so, now it's time for your executive summary, or I should say for the survivor's executive summary to start coming together. So once the incident allegation log's been completed, and it doesn't have to be completed, it just needs to have information in it. It might never be completed, right? It's a fluid document. 
but has enough information to sufficiently start pulling out or circling the most impactful <coughs> incidents. You can also use these, this information to start putting things in chronological order. All of these things then, she's gonna go through and pull out the biggest, perhaps, the most traumatic, the most concerning, and that is what Ruth calls the highlight reel, right? That is what will go immediately into your executive summary. And we, as the left brain, should also encourage her to put down some examples of what um, these types of abuse were. So for example, let's say she's got four incidents of uh, humiliation. Put all four of them down. Put three of them down. You know, just because you have one for humiliation doesn't mean you don't need to talk about the other ones. You can certainly put them all down. Put them all under the heading humiliation. So your incident and allegation log is your notebook. It has your chapters or headings in it. It has your dates in it, and it has your organization in it. So once you are able to pull the highlight reel from the incident and allegation log, you're ready for the final step, which would then actually be completing the executive summary. So she knows her name, she's got the date, she knows what audience she wants to speak with or write to, and she knows the goal that she's trying to convey to that audience, whether it's to the court system, maybe it's to a therapist or, or a priest. And she can then take all of this information to be able to share that, whether if she wants them to read it or if she just wants to use it as a prompt for her own discussion. Now she will possibly, for example, it's like taking this to the court, right? let's say attaching it as a declaration to a restraining order. Um, she would probably want to give some background information. We've been married this long. We're not married, but we have some kids. Our kids are this old. We've been together this long. Um, I have filed for divorce, I'm still living with this person, et cetera. Some background information. And then um, Ruth calls them the issues, right? Or the examples of abuse. And you can list that by date, and you can list that by heading, as we just said a moment ago. Humiliation, listed. Isolation, taking away all my friends and family, listed physical abuse, list it. Or May 2019, incident, incident, incident. July 2019, incident. That is your client's choice. And whichever way their brain is gonna work better using their incident and allegation log is the way that they're gonna wanna put it together. Because it will help them understand. And that's the point. So then you're also going to attach the evidence, right? These are the screenshots of the text messages or the pictures of the bruising or um, the report card from the teacher saying um, that dad is no longer welcome because he was overly aggressive, whatever. All of that evidence then could get attached to the executive summary. And she can offer to whomever she wants to show this paperwork to, again, her choice. And um, it will be able, the whole document itself will be able to help her explain why she is reaching out for help. So that is the executive summary. It is a system that Ruth Darling has developed with Women SV to be able to get 
the trauma brain a little mo more coherent to be able to move on, to be able to find empowerment, to be able to find healing, and to be able to find life again and freedom. And I'm happy to announce, and I congratulate Ruth, that it's going to be published and it'll be available next year. And the e version will be available hopefully at the beginning of next year, if not sooner. And that will have all of the worksheets in it that we just talked about, as well as uh, the talking points and things of that nature. Um, so that's pretty exciting. The work that I do um, as a domestic violence attorney, we're all, I'm always looking for new tools. I'm always looking for ways to be able to communicate responsibly with um, the people involved in the case, but most importantly, my client, the victim survivor. Um, I also want to communicate responsibly with the abuser if he's not being represented by counsel. So if any of you are attorneys, that is also something to think about as well. Again, at an entire other training, I am happy to talk with you offline about that. Um, but yeah, so I think that reviewing the steps of the executive summary workshop really do provide a very useful additional tool to help us, the members who are in the system, the members of the community who are in the system, be able to provide tangible assistance as opposed to go here, do this, go here, do that. We're able to speak to the human instead of the issue by having these kinds of points to be able to discuss to elicit information and to help our clients with this kind of new journey that they are going to find empowerment on. And it will take them a while, but we are here to help them find that. So, that being said, here are some wonderful examples of self-care. I think it is the weekend and we all deserve some. So I know I'm gonna go forest bathing tomorrow, unless I go sand bathing maybe, but there'll probably be a lot of people down there. Um, one thing Ruth does want to say is that um, make sure to congratulate your survivor on her courage and her perseverance making it just even this far, right? And the very last but very important step, it's going to be intense and challenging, um, but making it all the way through the process. So take some point to regroup, revamp your client. Just be, you know, take the kids to the park, enjoy, and, uh, and, and learn to appreciate what we've been given so we can help others appreciate when they get it back. 